Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue right along with our series on the colonies during the English Commonwealth. Today we stop in Connecticut where we last left off in 1652 and the colony still dealing with a periodic witch trial here and there. There was a witch trial hysteria that lasted for about 15 years from the late 1630s to the mid 1650s and every now and then somebody would be accused of witchcraft and they'd be executed. Now in July of 1652 England declares war on the Netherlands and with Connecticut being right next door to New Netherland we're gonna have to see how that plays out. We're sure that this got the colony's attention although we haven't seen too much in the writings. In early 1653 a shortage of food in the colony led to the banning of exports ranging from corn and grain to butter, cheese, and bacon. It was in March that the colony ordered the activation of its military. So the military is being activated and requests its whole military provision from the United Colonies. Now, if you'll recall, the United Colonies is a confederation of colonies in New England. It's Connecticut, New Haven, Plymouth, and Massachusetts Bay. Rhode, uh, Rhode Island is not a member. And the United Colonies has set aside a provision for an entire army so each colony would send a certain percentage and they are now requesting the colony of Connecticut that the United Colonies bring in their provisions so they're ready they're ready to uh, have a conflict here the general court goes even a little bit further let's have a look at the writing this court orders that the neighboring Indians to the several plantations within this jurisdiction should be required to give an evident testimony of their fidelity to the English by dividing up their guns and other arms to the governor or magistrates and those that refuse to do so may justly be deemed and looked at by them as their enemies. It goes on that they are not to shoot off any guns or guns in the night or walk in the night except when they come with a message to the English. In such cases, they are to be divided up themselves to the watch, but if they run away from the watch, the watch may shoot them. If you're a native now, the way you show your allegiance to the colony is to give up your weapons. Gun confiscation and martial law for the natives. This in a colony, if you'll recall from a previous episode, had a mandatory gun ownership law. In May, the general court established the grounds for training the militia. Training started on the west side of the river, then a separate training was established on the east side, so that no colonist had to regularly cross the river for training. The United Colonies met and determined that a force of 500 men would be enough to call up against New Netherlands should a war break out. The breakdown of the army would be 333 from Massachusetts, that's two-thirds, 69 from Plymouth, 65 from Connecticut, and 42 from New Haven. John Dawes was banished from the colony at the same court session for threatening Governor Edward Hopkins. Should Dawes return to the colony, he would be executed. The general court met on May 21st to determine what towns the 65 men would come from. They determined that there would be 15 from Hartford, 12 from Windsor, 8 from Wethersfield, 8 from Fairfield, 5 from Pequot, later known as Stonington, five from Seabrook, three from Farmington, and one from Matbazek, and one from Norwalk. The 65th man would be an officer. The court also gave John Winthrop the Younger the authority to pull trees from swamps for his sawmill. 
On June 25th, the general court met again, and the issue of Massachusetts Bay's commitment came up. And we had talked about this on a previous episode from the Massachusetts Bay side. The court moved that its position be that the Articles of Confederation for the United Colonies bind Massachusetts Bay to defend its allies. The court did agree that if Massachusetts Bay would back out, they would ask for permission to solicit the colony for volunteers. So, you're not going to provide us with the people we need. Can we at least ask amongst your people if anybody wants to volunteer? On June 27th, powder from England came to help defend the colony. In October, the commissioners returned with word that Massachusetts Bay was not going to participate in the army. So now the defense force goes from 500 to 167. Governor Hopkins would call a special general court session. A message was voted on and sent to the Lord Protector, that's Oliver Cromwell, asking for assistance. In November, the general court met and agreed to send a grant of 20 pounds to Harvard College. So that's Connecticut sending 20 pounds to Harvard College. At this time, I want to take the opportunity to introduce Thomas Minor. Thomas Minor was a colonist who started a diary in 1653. It provides insight into his life in Connecticut. And he lived in Pequot, which was later called Stonington. Thomas and his wife Grace were the original settlers, and by the early 1650s, Thomas was in his early 40s. Ulysses S. Grant, President Grant, and Ned Lamont are descendants of the miners. One entry on February 8, 1654 was Miner's last will and testament. He left his home, cattle, and goods to his wife and children. The spring of 1654 has entries about Miner working the land and carrying corn to the mill. Later that spring, the colony had to deal with the sudden death of John Haynes, who had served every other year as the colony's governor going back to its founding. The spring general court sessions would operate without a governor. Instead, they were called by Deputy Governor Thomas Wells, so he stepped in. The court officially banned the Dutch from the colony in the spring session. An order was also passed forbidding the sale of liquor to the natives. The May 1654 court appointed assistants to magistrates and gave them duties such as handling misdemeanors, and this was likely done to manage the colony's growing needs. The deputy governor called an emergency session on June 13, 1654. Here, a letter had come in from Oliver Cromwell requesting that the United Colonies meet and determine the number of troops to commit to a war against the Netherlands. So now Massachusetts Bay is being asked by England to step in. The court gave instructions to its commissioners that Connecticut's commitment is not to exceed 200 if Massachusetts fails to join, and that volunteers should only be solicited if the standing army fails to reach 400 or 500. We discussed uh, in Massachusetts Bay episodes how things went from that perspective, and I think hearing from the Connecticut side is better because obviously they are threatened the most by this war with New Netherland. One month later, the general court is called and trade with the Dutch is repealed. And this is because the war ended in late 1654. So now Connecticut is just fine in terms of trading with the Dutch. The court in October ordered 45 men into the Narragansett Territory in a war against the Ninigret. Uh, this war was called by the United Colonies. So Connecticut while Massachusetts Bay may not deliver when the United Colonies calls, Connecticut is delivering. A group of 24 men would go first, followed by 21 later. A detailed census in September 1654 found that the colony had 700 
77 men, with the exception of Pequot, which needed to have a formal hearing to perfect its numbers. The court that month also ordered Thomas Minor, who we've talked about, who has the journal, to send his son John to a man by the name of Mr. Stone to be trained. Thomas also mentions this in his diary in November of that year. Thomas Wells fills the vacant governor's spot in May of 1655. While John Haynes had died, Edward Hopkins, who served every other year that Haynes didn't, had returned to England and was later elected to Parliament there. He would never return to Connecticut, so the colony was really without its gubernatorial leadership that had the, all the experience, with the exception of a gentleman that had served for one year. In October of 1655, the census was more incomplete than the year before, and the court fined Seabrook and Norwalk 40 shillings for not reporting their census. Fast forward to the spring of 1656, where John Webster is now named governor. In the October session, price controls were placed on liquor and wine. The court also weighed in on the Quakers. Let's have a look. No town within this jurisdiction shall entertain any Quakers, ranters, Adamites, or such like notorious heretics, or suffer to continue with them above the space of 14 days, upon the penalty of five pounds per week for any town entertaining any such person. But the townsmen shall give notice to the two next magistrates or assistants who shall have the power to send them to prison, until they can be conveniently sent out of the jurisdiction. While Quakers weren't being whipped, like they were in Massachusetts, they are banned from Connecticut. Any ship that brings a heretic is ordered to take them away from the colony with a penalty of 20 pounds for failing to comply. The court also forbid the sale of horses and ships to the natives and cracked down on fraud being committed by butchers and tanners. In May of 1657, a new governor is named, John Winthrop the Younger. Winthrop was invited to live in Hartford, Connecticut, at the same property used by former Governor John Haynes. The court also issued an additional order against the Quakers, it's kind of like Massachusetts here, one thing after another. Let's have a look at the writing. This court, being duly sensible of the danger this commonwealth is in, of being poisoned in their judgment and principles by some loathsome heretics, whether Quakers, Ranters, Adamites, or some others like them, it is ordered and decreed that no town or person therein shall give entertainment to any of the aforesaid known heretics upon penalty of five pounds for each heretic. A five pound fee was also added if anyone spoke to the designated heretics. So they're working to find their way out of this problem, if you will. The August court got caught into a fight amongst the natives. A native murdered the sachem of another native tribe. That tribe called for revenge and requested the Connecticut colonists assistance in their plans. John Winthrop the Younger noted that the offender's uncle had been killed by the opposing tribe prior to this incident and that the Connecticut colony would press for peace. In October, the court imposed a 10 shilling fine for anyone possessing Quaker literature. At this point, no punishments have been handed down for Quakerism, so I'm assuming nobody's shown up yet, but maybe they have and they're just not recording it. But the official record right now is void of any actual punishments. A dispute in the church had also broken out at the same time, and the court called for the elders of the churches to gather and to settle their differences. This is a little different than Massachusetts Bay in that the government's a little more hands-off. They're encouraging a settlement, but they're not in it. They're not the ones mediating it. 
In May of 1658, Thomas Wells is elected governor again. Natives were fined at this court session for starting a fire that apparently caused damage to the town of Southampton. The fine was 200 pounds to be paid over the next five years. Samuel Stone presented a petition regarding the church dispute. He noted that the affected individuals had left the church and that the problem was no longer with the church of Hartford itself, but with those who had left the church. The August court brought up a dangerous issue in Farmington where nearby natives were engaged in skirmishes and stray bullets would occasionally be fired into the town. One of the tribes involved had been given permission to live in Farmington, and the court requested that they now leave the town. And why, why not? I mean, if they're going to be fighting and bullets are going to be flying into the town, get them out of there. The court also weighed in on the Church of Hartford controversy, requesting that the withdrawers participate in the negotiations. That's the people who left. The court stated that it would assert itself in the process and choose individuals to mediate the dispute. So now they are becoming more like the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The October court levied a penny or one pence per pound tax on estates. In May 1659, John Winthrop the Younger was once again named governor. And this would be the beginning of a lengthy term for him. This would last a while. We're going to be talking about him for a period of time. In June, the court established a day of humiliation to pray for the unsettledness in England. This is the only real mention of England. We didn't get any correspondence from Oliver Cromwell like we had in Massachusetts or Virginia or Maryland for that matter. The Connecticut records either did not record correspondence from England or they didn't receive any, but they were aware of the unsettledness in England. In November, the estate tax was raised to a penny and a half per pound on estates. That's a 50% increase. The court also acknowledged the Farmington natives were two years behind on paying for that fire. So it's probably not going to get paid for. I think the lack of acknowledgement of England is an interesting contrast between here and Massachusetts Bay. It seems Connecticut was less caring of what was going on over there, and I think vice versa. Also, we saw laws passed against the Quakers, but not enforced, which I guess leads me to believe that nobody showed up. So all in all, pretty uneventful in Connecticut. But next week, we're going to go to Rhode Island, where we talk about the colony coming together. But even though they came together, it does not mean that they got along. And we'll talk about that next time on Historical Context.